uh, our theme for this month, the month of December, is uh, our month of thanksgiving. Our month of thanksgiving. That's what we are exploring this week, I mean this month. And we have our scripture reference that is coming from Psalms 95, verse 1 to verse 2 right there, on that, uh, um, that uh, banner there, which says, O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. This is a month when we celebrate the Lord for what he's done for us. And even some of those who have come to visit with us, they've come to give thanks to God. And we are grateful to God for that. And uh, my scripture reference, which I want us to read before we sit, is drawn from the book of uh, Psalms again, chapter uh, 100. And we'll be reading just a few scriptures there. There is a very short psalm. 100 from verse 1 to verse 4. And I, I want to f explore the sermon I began on last Sunday, that is, come with thanksgiving. That's what I want to talk about today. And next Sunday, we will complete it as we come to our real thanksgiving day on 17th of November, this coming, this coming Sunday. So if you have your Bible with you, please take your Bible in your hands. I want you to read with me. And as the custom is, if you don't have your Bible, we have graciously provided a screen where you can be able to read with us. And I'll ask us if we can read together those few portions of scripture. Then you will sit and I will share what the Lord has put in my heart. Psalms 100 verse 1 to verse 4. Are you ready for that? Are you ready? Right, let's read together. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. All the earth. I can't hear you. Let's read together. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Verse 3, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Then verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful this is the day that you've, you've made, that, Lord, we may rejoice and be glad in it. From the beginning of the year, January, we are now in December. You've been such a faithful God. We have seen your hand upon us. We have seen your blessings upon our lives. Just like the song that the men have sung here, we come to say, thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have given to us. We are here today just to celebrate you and to thank you for the many, many wonderful things the Lord, you have done for us. And as we sit in your presence to hear your word for this day, may your blessings rest upon each one of us. And may you minister to us, Lord, as we give you thanks in this day. We give you praise. We give you honor. Bless the, the, the giver of the word. And also bless the hearer and the receiver of this word. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray and we believe and we together say, amen. amen and amen. Be seated in the presence of God. All right. Now, I'll begin by asking how many were not with us last Sunday because that will help me to know whether I should make a quick recap on what we shared last Sunday because it's a continuation of what we were sharing last Sunday. If you're not here, just apart from our visitors, just lift up your hand. I'll... Okay. Well, there are not as many as I would imagine. Now, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Kindly, when you get home, get into our YouTube channel and uh, try to go through the sermon that we shared last Sunday because that will help you to, co to, to connect seriously, to connect well with what I will be sharing this wonderful morning. Okay? But for the sake of those who are here for the first time, we have been talking about thanksgiving. That has been our topic. And my message has been, come with thanksgiving. According to Psalms, uh, that is Psalms 80, 80, 95, verse 1 and verse 2. And I've been asking myself, or we've been asking ourselves, what do we mean when we talk about thanksgiving? Because for many of us, we've, we've always thought that thanksgiving is when you put your package and offering, and you come to the altar, and you give it, and you say, I have come to give thanks to God. That's what I thought for many years. For some of us, we think thanksgiving is when you come and sing a praise. You just come and sing a song. And you say, I have given my thanks to God. But I came to discover that thanksgiving 
from the scriptural point of view, has more meaning than just coming to sing a song or just coming and giving God an offering or coming just to say thank you to God. I looked at a few definitions of thanksgiving. And uh, the Bible definition of thanksgiving has been drawn to us by many wonderful scholars. And one of the scholars, as I said last Sunday, who impressed me on what thanksgiving is, is a man by the, who is called, whose name is Strong. Strong, Nguvu. That's his name, Strong. This man is one of the best Bible scholars that I know of, that, have re- that has written some of the greatest, the greatest by, uh, in, in the Bible material that we have today. We have the Strong's Dictionary, one of the best dictionaries, Bible dictionaries that we have. And we also have the Strong's Concordance, one of the best that we have. And in Strong's definition, he says the word thanksgiving comes from a, a Hebrew word, which is the word toda. Toda. And the word toda basically has three meanings. It means confession, praise, and offering. That's what, that's what thanksgiving is all about. Confession, praise, and offering, according to toda. And then he says, when we give thanks in the truest sense of the biblical word, this biblical word, we offer God our praises and we acknowledge, that's the word, we acknowledge God that he is he who gives us all the good gifts that we enjoy in life. So the meaning of the word thanksgiving is not just basically coming in and giving an offering or just coming in or probably just uh, making a praise or doing anything of that nature. Thanksgiving is when we acknowledge, we acknowledge that God is the giver of everything that we have in the lives that we have today. The meaning, the dictionary meaning, that is the ordinary dictionary meaning, it says thanksgiving is the act of giving thanks. A grateful acknowledgement of the benefits and the favors that God gives to his people. When God has blessed you, when God has given you his favors, the only way you can express, the only way you can be able to show him that you are grateful for that, you do it through the act of thanksgiving. It is basically a, a public celebration in acknowledgement of God's divine favors and God, God's divine uh, kindness. But I want to borrow from the definition of this man, Strong. The thanksgiving has three aspects. Number one, the aspect of confession. Number two, the aspect of praise. And number three, the aspect of offering. And we looked last, last Sunday, we began to look at how did thanksgiving come about? Or how did it come about to have these three aspects? We discovered, and this I'm doing this for the sake of those who are not here last Sunday. We discovered that when God made man, Adam in the Garden of Eden, God made Adam when he was a complete, he was complete with everything he needed. Adam never lacked anything in life. In fact, the Garden of Eden was designed by God himself, and he planted it, like we learned. And he put Adam into that garden with literally everything which Adam needed. In fact, the Bible tells me he gave him the garden, and he gave him the fruits that were there. He gave him dominion over the things that were in that garden. And he told Adam, take, have dominion over this. But unfortunately, as we have read in scripture, Adam did not acknowledge God as the giver of all things. And I was asking, how did Adam do that? Because when God had given Adam the garden of Eden, there was one tree in that garden. And this is where I'm coming to, one tree in that garden. That was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were two very special trees. One was the tree of life. The other one was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, God set these two trees in the midst of that garden. The garden was good for food. It was good to look at. Literally everything you can think of was provided for in that garden. But this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God told Adam, this one, do not touch it. Because he said, the moment you will touch it or you will eat of it, you will die. Now, to me, what I've come to discover God simply wanted to test Adam's, to find out whether Adam acknowledges him as the giver of all those things that Adam had. He wanted to test Adam's loyalty to him, to find out, can Adam trust me and believe in me? That tree was set in that garden to see whether Adam could be able to know or to acknowledge God as the giver of everything which was in that garden. And that's the reason why God said, this one, it is in the garden, it's yours, but do not touch, do not eat it. Now, Remember, the temptation the devil brought. The temptation was, did God say? 
Why did God say? Because he wanted to put Adam in a state where Adam would not acknowledge God as the giver of all those things. Tempted Adam. God said, if you eat, God knew if you eat this tree, you will be like him. And basically what he was telling Adam, if you become like God, you will never need to depend upon God. You can be able to have your own dependency. You can depend on yourself. You can be able to, to, to do the things which God is doing and you don't need God in your life. And this is the place where the temptations come into our lives when we put God out of our lives and we are not willing to put our dependence on him. Adam failed the test and we know this, he failed the test. And we know as soon as Adam failed the test, God came back to Adam and asked him, Adam, where are you? And we found Adam hiding away from God and he's saying, God, I am naked, I cannot, you know, the fellowship which he had with God was completely cut off. Now, I always used to believe that God cast Adam. And I want to make this very clear, particularly for those who are listening to me over this message for the first time. God never cast Adam. It's, a, it's something which I believed for so many years. I discovered what God did instead of cursing Adam, God went to the source of his provision. That is the garden which he had given to Adam. The earth which he had given to Adam. The soil which he had given to Adam. And the Bible tells me God began to curse the ground. And this scripture, we'll find it in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, if we can turn there very quickly, verse 8 to verse 14. God cursed the garden. Gen sorry, Genesis chapter, 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 chap let me just get it right. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to verse 19. 17 to 19. Let me read this portion of scripture, then I'll go to my next point, which I need to explore this morning. The Bible says, and unto Adam... He said, this is now God speaking to Adam. And he said, because you have, you have hearkened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Now read with me what God did to Adam. What did God do? Can you read with me? He said what? Cast is the ground for your sake. So what did God cast? The ground. The ground is the place where we derive our, li our, our livelihood from. What I, I would call here, it is the source of our provision, the place where we get our provision from. He says, cast is the ground for your sake, for Adam's sake. And he went ahead and pronounced three very powerful curses on the ground, which I want us to look at and, and, and see when we come for Thanksgiving, what do we come to do? He went further and he said, and I want you to read with me what he said there. He said, in sorrow, the word sorrow there is very key. In sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of your life. It means for you to be able to, 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 to eat from the ground. For you to be able to get your provisions from the ground. You will do it in sorrow. So the first thing which God pronounced was sorrow. And I'll explain what sorrow is. Then he went further in verse 18. He says, thorns and also thistles shall it bring forth to thee. By the way, there were no thorns, there were no thistles on the earth. In the Garden of Eden, there were only trees that were bearing fruits. And everything was fantastic in that garden. But because of the sin of Adam, thorns began just to shoot out of the ground. Thistles began to shoot out of the ground. And the Bible tells me, they will, it, it will bring forth to thee. Then he went again and he says, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. I didn't mention last Sunday, herbs were not meant for you to eat. Actually, God, when he made you, you he was supposed to have eat, you only eating fruit, but not eating herbs. But today, what are we eating? Miranda? And what? Chisaka? Uh, help me here. Managu and all that stuff. That was not meant, they were meant for animals. All right? But man was meant only to eat the fruit of that land. Then God said there, you will eat the herb of the field. Okay? Now, if you go to verse 19, and please follow with me, because I just want to make my points and I'll be done. He says, in the sweat of your face, in the sweat of your face shall thou eat bread. Again, God introduced something which was not common to man. Man never used to sweat. Actually, you were just meant to enjoy the bliss of that garden. I want you to imagine an, an, an environment where you are not sweating. And I know even as I'm speaking here, some of you are sweating. When you go back home, you will, find, you will discover whether you are sweating or not. But listen, he says here, in the sweat of your face shall thou eat bread. Meaning every time you're eating bread, you sweat. 
That's why you wake up in the morning to go to work, you are sweating. You, your business, you are sweating. Whatever you do, you never do it out of just, you know, you do it out of struggle and you do it out of sweat. So sweat was, in, was introduced there. Then the last one he said is that, till thou return to the ground. Remember, man was made out of the ground. Now God says, now because you came from the ground, the ground will receive you and swallow you. Says, out of the ground, for out of it was thou taken. From dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So God pronounced what we call today death. So there are three things I want to bring to your attention. Which God actually casts, became a cause of a curse in the life of man. Not necessarily cursing you, but cursing the place where you produce from. The ground was actually cursed. And I was quick to mention in the first and the second service. This is the reason why the people who lived with Adam, or the, those who lived in the days of Adam, understood more of where we are coming from and where we are going than many of us. By the way, Adam saw the bliss of that garden. After Adam, the garden began producing thorns, thistles. People began sweating to get their bread. The waters which were in that garden, like we described last Sunday, the, the, the gold that was coming in, I believe, the, all those things began disappearing from the garden. But there is a man in the Bible called Noah. I know we know the story of Noah, isn't it? Noah was born by a man called Lamech in the Bible. For those who may not understand, know this, Lamech lived in the days of Adam. Adam lived up to over 900 years. 900, I think, and 70 or wrong. And what? And 30. 930. Thank you, Pastor Joyce. Adam lived for 930 years. So people, didn't, people used to live very long. And in the process, people were being born in the days of Adam. And one man in the Bible who lived in the days of Adam was the father of Noah. After Noah was born, Adam died. If you want to find out how, you go back and work history backwards from the dates. Work them backwards. You will realize Noah, I mean, Lamech lived for a few years before he saw the death of Adam. And I'm very sure Adam must have spoken to Lamech and told Lamech how the days of the, of the Eden Garden were. I mean, how the Garden of Eden looked like. And during that particular moment, the world had become so corrupt, believe me. The world had become so bad. I don't know whether it was as bad as we are today. Probably worse than what we are, I don't know. But the, the Bible tells me the world was so bad and so corrupt that even God from heaven, he looked down and he says, I regret why I made man. You know, when God makes a declaration of that nature, it means he's fed up with you. And I pray today, may the Lord not be fed up with us, especially who are seated here today. So he regretted why he had made man, okay? This makes me understand the reason why Lamech was yearning for the days of Adam. Lamech began yearning in, in his heart. He was just saying, Lord, if you can raise one man who can be able to bring us back into the days of Adam in the Garden of Eden, I will appreciate that. And thank God, when Noah was being born, Lamech is giving birth to Noah. The Bible says Lamech began to prophesy in the life of Noah and speak into the life of Noah. And that makes me remind you again, it's very important for you to speak in the lives of your children. And especially when they are being born. Even when they are in the, tum in the tummy. Say, just hold the tummy of your wife and say, you child, I bless you in Jesus' name. Sometimes do that. Okay? So when Noah was being born, and this one is just by the way, if you look at the book of Genesis chapter 5 and verse 28 and 29, particularly verse 29, you will see the Bible telling us what Lamech did. Noah, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 5 and verse 29. This is what the scripture says. It says, and he called, maybe we can begin from verse 28 so that you get to know what was happening here. 28, it says, and Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son. How many years are those? How many years are those? 182 is when Lamech was giving birth to Noah. Don't confuse, that's not the years he lived. He lived more than these years. But at 182, that's when he was giving birth to Noah. Then verse 29 says, and he called his name who? Now I want us to say together. He called his name who? Faith comes by? And hearing what? By the word. When you speak the word, faith is created. So he called his name Noah. And that name, as he was calling Noah, he was saying. What was he saying? The name Noah means that saying. He was saying, this same, now this man Noah that I'm giving birth to, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has done what? Has cast. And the words of Lamech became true. Believe me. 
It's, it's at that moment when God looked at Noah, and the Bible says, and Noah found favor in the eyes of God. God had to destroy the world of Noah, the wicked world of Noah, and he spared only Noah to create a new generation of men and women that would call upon his name. Because the Bible tells me people were not calling on the name of the Lord anymore. They were involved in all manner of evil until Noah came to bring up a new generation. What am I talking about? I'm simply telling you, God cast the ground. Lameki acknowledged, we are toiling, our hands are, are full of toil, our work is full of toil because of the ground which God has already cast. But the good news which I have for you this morning is that the Lord Jesus has reversed the curse that was upon the ground. I expected a better amen than that. Now listen, the good news is that we believers, we have a ground which God has blessed. We are not living in the days when the ground is still under curse. We are now living in days where if you believe, the Bible tells me, if you walk in faith, if you walk in the power and in the faith of the Lord Jesus, the Lord has given you authority over the ground that you are tilling. Because Jesus has reversed what was spoken in the Garden of Eden by the coming of Jesus, the Lord was doing a propitiation. I mean, God was reconciling the world back to himself, according to the scripture. And you will say, Pastor Mlema, what do you mean by that? Let me take you through, through the three things very quickly. The three curses. And show you in the Bible how Jesus reversed those three things. To bring us to the place where we can now confess, we can praise, and we can offer our, our offerings of thanksgiving. Are you still with me? Okay, number one. The first place is the curse of their sorrow and sweat. Sorrow and sweat. He said, in sorrow. Then he said, in sweat shall you eat. Meaning the food we are eating, the blessings we are having, we get them through sorrow and through sweat. Okay? Now, what is sorrow? Sorrow is simply, is distress caused by loss, affliction, and disappointment. It is an expression of grief, disappointment, sadness, or the like. Let me make it very easy. Sorrow is just basically distress. Distress. I've never seen anybody waking up in the morning and uh, standing up and shouting, oh, wow, what a beautiful day today. I'm enjoying going to work. How many of you enjoy going to work? Can I see your hands? I said the other day, you only enjoy the first one or two weeks when you've been employed because God has answered your prayer. But the moment you go to the one month, two months, three months, even waking up in the morning is what? A burden. Because distress, distress, sorrow, Nobody enjoys work. There's nobody who does enjoy that. And the reason is simple. It's because of that curse that was upon it. It means every time you are working, but you, are never, you, you never get the reward of your work. You're always under distress. You're always under disappointments. You're always living, living and trying to make ends meet, but seems, things don't seem to be working for you. In our places of work, in our businesses, in the things that we do on a daily, even the wife, the housewives in the home, you will find there is still distress in that home. And the reason was very simple, because God put a curse on the, on, on the ground that we till. So when we talk about sorrow, we are talking about a state of distress. And I can tell you, every human being is perpetually under the state of distress. How about sweat? To save my time on this. Sweat is simply to perspire, especially freely or profusely. To exude, to, to exude in drops of small particles of moisture. It means to work hard. Sweat is when your body begins removing some drops of water from within because of the hard work. You can do it profusely or you can do it silently. When you are not working, it is coming out silently. Even now it is coming. You know, I can, I can, I can see it in some of you. But when you begin working very hard, you are trying to put effort in everything you are doing, whether you are thinking, whether you are applying your hands, whether you are walking, you begin producing sweat profusely. And sweat basically here, if I could speak, is basically, is basically something which we toil. Best sweat is toiling. When you are toiling, toiling, the word toil is when you are working very hard to get something. Actually, you are sweating. You might not be sweating physically in your body, but as long as you are toiling to get it, it is actually sweating. So those two things, God spoke on the ground. And he said in sweat, and he said in what? The other one is what? In sorrow is only when you can eat. Now, Thanksgiving is when we give God the praise because we know even in sorrow 
and in sweat, the Lord has been gracious to us. Are you listening to me? Now, Jesus changed that thing. Believe me, Jesus reversed that thing. Now, there is something which I want to share with you this afternoon before I, I get into this. Jesus, when he was being crucified on the cross of Calvary, this beautiful cross here, so many things happen behind the background which people don't know. I know we read our Bibles, and I keep telling you, when you read your Bible, don't read like a newspaper. In a newspaper, you just rush through. You see the heading. If it excites you, you read it. But you don't, you don't go into the details of what it is that was being communicated. Now, the Bible has a lot of hidden revelation. A lot, believe me, a lot. This is why preachers are there. To try to bring out, you know, reveal to us some of the hidden things which are there in scriptures. Now, when I come to the death of Christ on the cross, there was, there was so much, so much revelation. So much thing, so many things that were going on behind the background, which the enemy, the devil, has blinded our eyes from. And those are a few of the things I want to bring to our attention here. One of the things that happened, Jesus dealt with the three curses I've mentioned, those three curses, on the cross of Calvary. And I will start with, again, the first one, sweat and, and sorrow. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 37 to 39. And I'll ask my media team to show you a man who is sweating and a man who is sorrowful. The eye of a man who is sweating and a man who is sorrowful. For you to see what I'm talking about here. You see, can you see that picture behind there? Please remove the, the, the words from that picture so that we can see that fellow properly. Look at that. That's, that's, that, that, that's a, a, a person who is sweating and a person who is sorrowful. All right? Now, Matthew chapter 26, verse 37 to 39, explains something that happened before Jesus was just about to go to the cross. Jesus has been with us for three and a half years ministering to his disciples, and now he's about to go to fulfill the purpose to which God brought him, to die on the cross. So what does Jesus do? The Bible tells me he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. I think you know who these two sons were. This was who and who? John and James. There were three men that were in the inner circle of Jesus' life. Peter, John, and James. People who saw things which other people didn't see. I normally tell people there are things which only the 12 saw. There are things which the three saw. And there are things which only one saw. So you, it, depending on how you relate with Jesus, you can be limited to the crowd, or you can be limited to the 12, or to the three, or to the one. Now here he picks the three, and they go together. And the Bible tells me, and he began, he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. This is Jesus. He began to be sorrowful and very heavy. He was leading them to the mountain we call, the garden we call the Garden of Gethsemane. The last place where Jesus prayed before he went to Mount Calvary to go and die there. So he's taking with him these three men to begin what we call as his journey of agony. Those who've watched the play, uh, the, the one that was done, uh, The Passion of Christ, Okay. This Jesus was beginning now his passion, his passion to die for us, okay? So he picks the three men, and the three people, and he goes with them. And for the first time in the life of Jesus, he's described as a man full of sorrow. And the question is, why was he becoming very sorrowful and very heavy? I believe what Jesus was doing, he was beginning to deal with the curse which God had put upon the ground in the Garden of Eden. So if you keep on reading, it says in verse 38, look at verse 38. And he said unto them, read with me, what did he say? I want to hear from you, what did he say? My soul is exceedingly, what? Sorrowful. God began to deal with the soul of Jesus. To put it in the state in which the soul of Adam would be until Jesus comes. He began to feel very exceedingly sorrowful. You put yourself in a state where you are exceedingly sorrowful. Yesterday we were burying one of my, uh, uh, my, my friend's father, Pastor Vincent. And there was a young man. This one I can, I can speak because it was, it was very obvious. There was one young man who was seriously sorrowful. Very sorrowful. I think it must be, it must be, uh, he, 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 he must be one of the cousins to, to Vincent. The young man was so sorrowful until we planted somebody next to him to help him. And when we were taking the body to the grave... The boy questioned, he kept on questioning the body in sorrow. Where are you going? Why are they putting soil on you? He went and fell on the, on the casket. 
And I could see the agony of his heart. The agony of his heart. You put yourself in a state where you are so sorrowful that you cannot even control yourself. This is what was happening to Jesus. Exceedingly sorrowful. And the Bible says sorrowful unto what? Unto death. It means this sorrow was enough to kill Jesus. I know people who, when they get some bad news, someone was giving me a story. In fact, not even someone. The same, same, my brother, where I was the other day. His grandfather had a land. Okay, not, let, let me not make it public here. Some, he had land somewhere. All right? And then somebody went and took that land and changed the title of that land into his name without him knowing. So when the time came for him, he wants to apportion the land to his, his sons. He realized someone had already taken the land and he has turned it into his name. And that person wasn't anybody but a young man whom he had adopted as his adopted son. When the Mzell was told you don't have anything here, he became so sorrowful, he collapsed and he died. I'm giving an example to tell you, don't take this word here easily. This is very serious. He was so sorrowful to death that the Bible tells me he, he, to, he told them, tarry ye here and watch with me. Jesus went and began to agonize. And the agony he was going through was to agonize to remove the curse of sorrow that had been inflicted upon Adam in that land, in that garden which God had given to Adam. You know, the Bible, the New Testament has four Gospels. Those four Gospels are written by four authors. One is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each of these authors writes about Jesus. Each one of them has a way in which he, has, he saw Jesus and the way he wrote. But there's one author called Luke. Luke, the Bible says, was the most accurate author. Because he says, I have written everything I knew about him from the time he was born until the time he went to heaven. That's why Luke extends his author, I mean, I mean his writings to the book of Acts. Luke extends beyond here and begins to tell us what Jesus was going through. And you'll find this in the book of Luke chapter 22 very quickly, verse 23 to verse, verse 43 to verse 45. Allow me to be a little fast here. Because I will not talk about the other two if I go at this speed. Now, Luke 22 verse 43. It says this. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Jesus was so, so much in agony and pain that God dispatched an angel from heaven to come and strengthen Jesus. What am I talking about? I'm telling you, sorrow was reversed. You are not getting my point. Tell your neighbor, sorrow was reversed. And it was not done in an easy way. Believe me, it took an angel to go and strengthen Jesus. Look at verse 40, 44. 44 says, And being in an agony, he prayed even more what? Honestly. And his what? Sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down where? To the ground. Now Jesus agonized, prayed in agony, prayed in agony. Until the Bible tells me his blood, I mean his sweat, again to deal with the sweat aspect. The sweat of Jesus began dropping down as blood, as blood. Somebody has written somewhere in a commentator, he has said, it was literally blood because of the, you know, you've got vessels in the body. Those vessels, when you, 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 you stress them, they normally crack. That's why people have clothes. But Jesus, the Bible tells me, he began to sweat until his sweat became as thick as blood. And the good thing, it didn't remain on the face. It fell where? On the ground. To do what? To save us from the curse of the ground. Now, this may, not, this may be writings which have just been written in the Bible. But I can tell you, every scripture in the Bible has a meaning. God was orchestrating behind the scene to remove the curse that he had said, in sweat and in sorrow shall ye eat of the fruit of this land. And I'm happy to report that Jesus has taken away your sorrows. No wonder the book of Isaiah says he took away our sorrows and our pains. It means, friend, where, where you were to be agitated, where you were to go through stress and to go through distress, the Lord Jesus has taken that, that distress on your behalf. Amen. I expected a better amen than that. Let me go to point number two. The thorns and the thistles. I'll leave the other things. The thorns and the thistles. Thorns 
I found a dictionary meaning for that one. Not, a, not strong. This one was dictionary meaning. It says stones are what? Help me here. They are ex... That word is a bit tough for my, 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 my... Ex... That's it from the dictionary. Of what? On a, on a plant. Especially, what is it? I put it in the yellow. What is a thorn? A sharp, pointed, aborted branch. Now listen, the Garden of Eden had no thorns. It had only fruits on branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. All right? But immediately Adam sinned. The Lord, com the Lord casts the ground. Instead of the branch, what began coming on the branches? Thorns. So a thorn is basically an aborted branch. Tell somebody aborted branch. Instead of the branch producing fruit, it produces a thorn. And I put in my notes here, I've said, anything which aborts in your life is a thorn in your flesh. Anything that aborts. And believe me, many of us are living in a season where our aspirations, our dreams, our visions, they all, they all abort at one point or another. You are just about to get a job, it aborts. Just about to get a good, a wonderful man or a woman to marry, it aborts. Just about to get a promotion, it aborts. Just about to do a business that can give you money, you find something has happened, it has aborted. What am I talking about? There were tones which the Lord said will begin to spring up. These were not things that were planted. The thorns just began springing up in the garden because of the curse which God had put upon the ground. And I say this, if you want to test, test, test what I'm saying, you go and plow your garden nicely. Plow it very nicely. Then disappear, go to Nairobi for two or three, three years and then come back. What will you find in that garden? You will find thorns and thistles. That's all you'll find. They just, autom they just come out. It means they are as a result of the cast ground. But the good news is this. Jesus reversed that also. How do, you know, how do I know that? I know. It's in the scripture. I have it in the book of Matthew 27, verse 28 to verse 30. And please, take that, take that into your heart. Matthew 27, verse, verse 28 up to verse 30. The Bible tells me, now Jesus has now reached the place of Calvary. And they are about to crucify him. Okay? He has dealt with, with tears he has dealt with, uh, with sweat in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now he has reached the place of Calvary where he's about to be crucified. What happens? It says, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. That's a message for another time. Even stripping Jesus and removing his garment was prophetic. Really prophetic. Putting on him a, a garment of, uh, of, of, of purple or scarlet was also prophetic. But let's forget about that. Look at verse 29. 29 says, and when they had, help me here, when they had done what? Uh, read with me, they had done what? I like it in King James because it says when they had planted. Planted. They did not just place. They planted. They had planted a what? A crown of thorns. They put it upon his head and, they, and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and they mocked him saying, Hail King of the Jews. These fellows, they didn't know they were fulfilling scripture. By the way, don't fulfill scripture in ignorance. Tell your neighbor, don't be used by the devil. By the way, you know Judas was used by the devil. Yeah, that's why the Bible calls him a son of what? Perdition. These guys just went to the, to, out there and collected a thorn, some thorns, and they made it into a crown. They didn't know they were fulfilling scripture. And then they came with it and planted it on the head of Jesus. Those who have seen his, this film, The Passion of Christ, you will see blood oozing out of his head. They literally planted, the thorns went into his head. They never knew they were fulfilling what? The scripture. To reverse the curse that God had put upon the ground. That's what I believe. Jesus was now taking the pain of that curse on himself. To make sure that you as a believer, you will never go again through the pains of those thorns in your life. Verse 30, look at verse 30. Verse 30, and they, sp they spit upon him, and they took the reed. This is now the reed, the, 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 the reed. And they smote him on the head. They were, they were fulfilling scripture here. To signify that the curse which God had spoken upon the ground, that the ground will produce stones and thistles, that curse was now coming to an end. 
You can say amen if you want. And then the last one, this is the last one, the curse of death. The curse of death. Death was now the, uh, the, the, the last in the list, the end of everything now. When Adam is now done and you are done, you will be put in the grave and the grave will receive you and that will be the end of you. But I'm glad also to let you know, Jesus also reversed the curse of death. Because death is basically, in my definition, is the end of life. Acting or dying. It's simply permanent cessation from all the vital functions of the, of the organism. And the symbol of death, the symbolic sign of death anywhere in the world is the skull. Skull, K-S-K-U-L-L. Those who, who drive, if there's a corner that is dangerous, you will see. They will write their danger. And you will see a picture of a skull there with the lines written with a, with a, with a cross in the center. Okay? So skull stands for what? For death. It means the, the last thing, in fact, the Bible says the last enemy to be defeated will be what? Death. So Adam was now to die, go into the ground, and, and the ground swallow him and receive him. But thank God for Jesus. Now, look at, look at this scripture quickly. This one, very fast. John chapter 19, verse 16 to 18. John 19, 16 to 18. We are almost done. 16 to 18. Can you just flash it? John 19, 16 to 18. This is what, now, what happens now here. It says, Then they delivered he, him, before, therefore, unto them to be crucified. This is now Pontius Pilate has now handed over Jesus to go to the cross to be crucified. So Jesus goes to the cross. They took Jesus and led him away. But where are they leading Jesus? Look at verse 17. 17 says, And bearing his cross, he went forth into a place. What was the name of that place? Read with me. Come on. It was called what? The place called a place of the skull. A place of the skull. When we, when we sing songs, we never sing about the skull. The Bible tells me, which is also called in Hebrew, Golgotha. We can sing Golgotha, Golgotha, Golgotha. But we don't see the skull. I've been to Jerusalem myself, to Israel more than six times. Even this year we were to go, but you know the Palestinian war. I mean, this is Palestinian war. The Hamas, this thing that has been going on. We couldn't make it. But when you arrive in Israel and you have done your tour, the last place we go to before we go to the grave, the graveside, is the place where Jesus was crucified. I tell my, 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 my media people to flash the picture of the Golgotha, I mean of, of, of Golgotha, and you see it. Golgotha, the place of the skull, has, looks like this. Can you flash it, my friend, up there? It looks like this. This is the way Golgotha looks. Give, give me a minute, I'll show you. Golgotha. That's how Golgotha looks like. That's the hill. And what they will always do, the tour guides, they will take you to the, the foot of the hill and they will tell you, study that hill and tell us what can you see on that hill. Now, do you see where there is a circle? What do you see there? Actually, this thing is in, inscripted in the, in the rock. It looks like a skull. You will see two eyes there. You will see the nose coming down there. Then you will see... Down there is like the broken, broken uh, uh, jaw down there. That's the way Golgotha looks like. It was not an accident that Jesus went to the place of what? The skull. To signify God was dealing with death. The, the last enemy in your life. God was bringing you to the place where death will be dealt with, dealt with once and for good. And the beautiful news is this. The Lord Jesus died for you. And death has been defeated. That's why Jesus told, told them at the, at the graveside of, a, of, 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 of his friend Lazarus, he says, He that believeth in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. But if you, 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 you live and you believe, you will never die. The good news is that Jesus defeated death. Now, if I ended there, you would say, Pastor Mlema, but you, How? Let me show you one more scripture here. Matthew chapter 27, Acts chapter 2, verse 24. Acts chapter 2, verse 24, quickly. We'll begin from verse 23. This is Peter standing on the first sermon he delivered on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 is Peter and Pentecost, for those who don't know the Bible. Okay? And he's now giving his sermon, the first sermon, after the resurrection of Christ. He's converting the first believers in the church. 
And Peter makes this statement about Jesus. I want you to read with me. He says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel. Th those were the, the people, who, the counsel which, which, which sanctioned his crucifixion. He says, and the, and, and the foreknowledge of God. To signify to me everything which happened in the, in the life of Christ was arranged by God. Ah, uh, come on people. Arranged by who? It means everything that was happening, including the things I've mentioned, they were pre-planned by God. But that's not the point. He says here, ye have taken him, and by wicked hands you have crucified and slain. You have crucified him, and you have slain him. Peter was preaching his first sermon. But the verse which excites me is verse 24. Verse 24 says, whom? Help me here. Whom? What? Read with me. God raised up. Having done what? Loosed the pains of death. Why? Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. To tell me death could not hold Jesus. The grave could not hold Jesus. To tell me the earth, the ground could not. The curse had already been broken. So Jesus comes out of the grave on the third day. Why the third day? There was some business he was doing down there for another day. He was losing the chains of those who had been bound in the grave and releasing them from the power of death so that these men and women can be taken away from the grip of death that was under the world to the heavens where they are seated right now waiting for you and me at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. To signify to me that there is no power at all in death anymore in the life of a believer. Why do I say this? These are the reasons. Quickly. Romans chapter 5 verse 19. I'm not explaining this one. I'm only reading. Romans 5 19. And the Bible says, whom? Romans 5 19 please. Quickly. The Bible says, as for, help me here. As for what? One man's disobedience. Who is this one man's disobedience? Adam. The curse that came upon us. Adam's disobedience. Many were made sinners. You became subject to sin because of Adam. You become subject to death because of Adam. You become subject to sorrow because of Adam. You become subject to tears because of Adam. But thank God, the Bible says, so by, help me here, the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Another scripture, Romans chapter 8, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians 3, 13. It says, help me, it says what? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. For it is written, help me here. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the cross. Meaning this cross settled it all. Everything that was supposed to be yours was exchanged on that cross. And finally, if you don't mind, finally, we can look at uh, Romans, I mean uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Romans 5 and verse 8. And this is what the Bible says. It says, but God commendeth his love towards us. Help me here. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what is thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is when you look back to what God has done for you. Thanksgiving is when you realize you were nothing out of Adam. You were useless out of Adam. There was nothing you could, be, you could have become out of Adam. But because Christ came and died for you, thanksgiving is when you recount what God has done for you. I tell people, Israel is always a picture of the church. When you read the story of Israel, you are seeing the picture of the church in the New Testament. For Israel, their bondage was in Egypt. And their place of rest was Canaan. God told Moses, when you reach the land which I'm giving to you, do not forget where I have brought you from. Always remember you are a slave. And when you remember what God has done for you, you go back to God and you tell him, Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. So thanksgiving for a believer is when you profess. You profess. Listen to me. It's not carrying money and bringing money. No. Thanksgiving is not singing a song. Those are the things that back your profession. But you come and you stand before God and you tell God, I was a sinner. I was bound in sin. Thanksgiving is when you say, Lord, I know 
I, I, my provisions were cast from day one. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, he has brought me to the place where now I am what I am. I said, the ground you till is the place where you work. The ground you till is the daily provisions that you have in your life. Thanksgiving is when you look back and you tell God, when the year started, I was nothing, but now you've made me something. Thanksgiving is when you tell God, look, I knew I was bound to die, but you've given me health. Thanksgiving is when you say, I knew I couldn't have gotten this job, but God, you gave me this job. It is when you recount the goodness of God and the works which God has done for you. And you come and profess them. You tell God you did A, B, C, D to me. And because you did that, I will sing your praise. Praises come in to tell God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for me. And we can only make our expression of thanksgiving by giving an offering to God. Because listen to me. It's only today when people don't know the meaning of offerings. In the olden times, nobody stood before God without a what? An offering. So you take an offering and you say, Father, this offering I'm bringing it to you to demonstrate or to express my heart of gratitude for what you have done for me. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. Solomon is not eating a turkey. It's when you come with a heart of gratitude. You look back at what God has done for you. You recount the goodness of God. You recount the blessings of God. This is why the book of Psalms is full of thanksgiving. The Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Then you begin recounting who healeth you from your sicknesses. Who forgives you from your sins. Who does this and this and that. You are simply making a profession. You are simply making a confession. Thanksgiving is not when you repent your sins. No. Sins were forgiven. You are simply telling God, I'm professing Jesus died for me. And I'm saying, I have every reason to believe he died for me. I have every reason to thank him for what he did for me. That is the spirit of thanksgiving. I think I'm done. I will stop at that. Could you stand up on your feet? Stand up on your feet. And kindly open Deuteronomy 26. This is homework I'm giving you. Homework. How many love homework? Parents, do you love homework? How many love homework? There's only one parent who loves homework. Eh? Can I give you homework? Now, next Sunday, our Thanksgiving Sunday, the last one, next Sunday, this is what we'll talk about. So let me give you this homework. You go and think about it as the worship team comes. We're just now almost done. And uh, you will think about it next Sunday. It will be easy for me to explain next Sunday, okay? This is what God told Israel, and I'm just tying it up to give you a picture that you can go think over, so that the words which I've shared with you from last Sunday, they, you can now connect with what I've been saying, okay? Adam sinned, Adam, the, the land was cast, then God made a provision to bring Adam back, to bring back what Adam had lost, and that's what we are enjoying here today. That's Thanksgiving. For Israel, we know, we'll get the story from that portion of scripture that I want us to read together, and then after that will be done. Look at Acts, Genesis, Deuteronomy 26, verse 1 to verse 11. I'll not explain, okay? But this is what Thanksgiving is all about, and this is what we're going to be doing on, Saturday, on Sunday when we come. This is Moses speaking to Israel when they are about to enter the land of Canaan, okay? And he's telling them how to give thanks. Are you, to, are, are you ready for that? Everybody's ready? Now he says, let's just do, read from the screen all of us. He says, and it came to pass, it shall be when you have come into the land, the ground, the land, which the Lord your God giveth to thee as an inheritance, to possess it and to dwell therein. You've, give, you've been given that job, you've given that promotion, you've bought that land, you are now in a place where you have taken possession, you are dwelling in there, you are working in there. He said in verse 2, let's go to verse 2, that thou shalt take, help me here, take what? The first of all the fruits of the earth. The, I'll explain those details next Sunday. The first of all the fruits, not all the fruits, the first of all. I grew up with Shago. I'm 63 years old. I'm not young. I'm just middle aged now. Middle aged. I'm still young. 63. Do I, don't I look young? Yeah. But let me tell you, I saw my mother. Those days, not today, not, I don't see today. My mother, every time we harvested, we had a very small farm. And get you quite key. What do you call that small basket? I want it in my, my language. It was called what? A shimwero. And get you shimwero. And we would walk with her in the field. And atua mahindi moja. 
Yeah? Mogo moja. She would collect a few of those things and put in a small shimwero. And she would give me to carry and we would go to the church and give it to the pastor. Just put it on the altar there on our Thanksgiving Sunday. But today, how many of you, you even pick a kimwero? Now, this is what he told them. Pick a basket. The basket wasn't meant to take all the food you have in the ground. You simply cut the first one, the first one. You can cut the first of the, the cast of the an apple, the, the first of the, of the banana, the first of the... The rest are yours. Put it in a basket. Can we read together? First of all the fruit of the land, which you shall bring of thy land that the Lord your God giveth thee. And you shall put it where? Help me here. In a what? In a basket. And then you shall go to the place where the Lord your God shall choose to place you there. Eh? To place his name there. And where is the place where the name of the Lord is mentioned? In the church. You go to the church. This way I'm glad for those who, who have understood the secret of thanksgiving. He says that thou shalt take. Can we go to verse, verse, verse 3 please? Verse 3 says, and you shall go to the priest that shall be in those days. And who is the priest here today? Who is the priest? Why don't you mention my name? <laughs> For those who are visiting our church, I'm not like those other pastors who take offerings. I don't take seeds here. So if you were carrying a seed, you will go back with your seed. In our church, we only teach people to give to God offerings and tithes out of free will. According to scripture. Is that not so? Is that not so? Yeah, that, that is our church. I'm, I'm sharing with those who perhaps you are visiting for the first time, you're wondering, when Pastor Mlema says, call my name, is this what he does every Sunday? No, I don't do that. I'm just telling you what is written there. You shall carry your basket and go to the priest that shall be there. The Bible says, in those days. So God was seeing even these days. And he says, and you will say to him, this is now confession, confession, profession. You will say, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God. The, the Lord thy God. Not the, the, the Lord your God is the, the Lord thy God of the priest. I'll give details on next Sunday on this. He says that I am come to the country which the Lord swore to my fathers to give me. So you will be saying, I've come to the place where when I came to this altar and you prayed for me, I was looking for a job and God has given me the job. Are you getting what I'm talking about? Let's move on. Verse 4. Verse 4, verse four says, the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. He'll take the offering and place it on the altar. Because this is where the blessings are. Verse 5. Look at verse 5. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord your God. Now you will again make, now this is what you are calling as a public confession. You will now begin professing what God has done for you. You will begin telling God how he has healed you over the year. You will tell him how people are sick. You are, you are never sick. You will tell him how you got that job. You will tell him out of many Kenyans, you are the only one who was picked to take that position. Sindio? You will tell him people was, were dead, you never died. You will begin professing. And then you will say, this were the Israelites, you say Assyrian. They were from Syria. But you, you come from where? Can you mention where you come from? Where? Mimi natoka Maragoli, Mahanga. Watch and yanze. Okay, I'm professing. A Maragoli ready to die was my father. And we went down from Mahanga to Nairobi. And we sojourned there with a few. And we have become now a big nation. I have a wife, I have children, I have everything. A great and mighty and populous. I'm making my confession. Okay, I came to Nairobi, I had no job, I have a job. I came to Nairobi in Likwana Tembea and air-conditioned pants. Now I'm putting on a suit. Those are things that this man, these fellows are confessing here. Then you go, you go on in verse 6 and you say, the Egyptians, the people in Nairobi, were not very kind to me because there were many devils there, isn't it? Say, those fellows did not entreat me well. They afflicted me. They laid upon me hard labor, taxes, and wherever you know. They are laying on you. Can you move on? Then you will go further and you will say, and when we cried to the Lord, even in the midst of all inflation, we cried to the Lord, isn't it? Yes. Or you are not crying? Yes. See, we've been crying. Yes. In the midst of all the challenges we've had, health challenges, problems, look at our road here, the way it looks. In the midst of all that, the Bible says, we cried unto our, our, and the Lord of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and he looked upon our affliction and our labors and our oppression. Let's move on. Then he says, and the Lord brought us forth out of that place eh, with a mighty hand. By the way, you will not go back to your countryside empty handed. You will go back with a mighty hand. And number two, with what? An outstretched arm. And with what? Great terribleness. Nobody will, will, will follow you. They'll be afraid of you. And he says here, with signs and with wonders. 
Then you will finish in verse 9 by saying this. And he has brought me to this place and he has given me this land or this job or this wife or this child, even a land that flows with milk and honey. Then you will finish in verse 10 by saying this. And now, can somebody say and now? And now what? Behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which the Lord has given to me. And thou shalt set it before the Lord your God after you put it here. Then you can now worship. You can now praise. That is the meaning of thanksgiving. That's how it is done. So we leave it at that. God bless you. We'll do it next Sunday. Can we close our eyes for a word of prayer? Father, we are grateful for allowing us to be here. Thank you for blessing us with many, many, many blessings. Manifold blessings, Lord. You have been so good. None of us has lacked anything. And if we did, we knew whom to run to. When we were down, we knew who would lift us up. When we were distressed, we knew who would give us hope. Today we are here and we are thankful. Thank you for your people. Those who are here every Sunday. And thank you for those that, Lord, you've chosen to come and share, celebrate this Sunday with us. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. And Father, we believe that this is the beginning of a new chapter in our lives. As we close 2023, 2024 will never be like any other year. We'll be a year with a difference. A year of signs and wonders. A year whereby your people, Lord, will come to know we serve the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you and we give you praise. If there be somebody here who doesn't know you, that you died for him on the cross, this is the time, Lord, for you to reveal yourself to him or her. Somebody who is not born again, touch that one, Father, and bring him or her to the cross where it all began. We thank you and we bless you.